Okay, so um, I posted a recording of Chapter 7's lecture having to do with uh, membrane transport. Okay, so make sure if you haven't watched this, make sure you do watch it and go over it. Uh, you can uh, email me with any questions, or remember I do have on uh, the syllabus about meeting on a, through Blackboard Collaborate if needed, okay? All right, let's move into Chapter 8. Now listen carefully. Chapters 8, 9, and 10 focus on biochemistry, a lot of biochem, all right? Um, so the way it's going to work, what we cover in Chapter 8 is definitely going to feed into Chapter 9. And then from chapter nine, we're gonna move on to chapter 10. And there's some relationships with chapter 10 or chapter 10 feeds off of some of both uh, chapters eight and nine. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'll try to point that out as we go, okay? So the title of this chapter is an introduction to metabolism. Okay, so this term metabolism here, metabolism is defined as chemical reactions in a living organism, or more specifically, chemical reactions within a cell, since this is a cell in molecular biology course. So the, we're gonna focus on two key components that are required, okay, to promote a chemical reaction or catalyze a chemical reaction. Energy, and then the other component which needs that energy as fuel, which are proteins called enzymes, okay? So proteins perform different functions, and I mentioned that in chapter seven. And in chapter seven, we focused on a subgroup of proteins that functioned in membrane transport. They were known as transmembrane proteins in general, but specifically called channel proteins and carrier proteins. Now in chapters eight through nine and 10, we're gonna focus on another subset of proteins, another subgroup of proteins that are responsible for catalyzing or promoting chemical reactions, meaning that they make them happen. And so therefore these proteins are given a special name. They're called enzymes. So it's no different than having a job. Everybody has a different job title, okay, uh, associated with the type of work they have to do. Well, if you recall, I said proteins do the work. So they're given different job titles. Now, as I said, metabolism has to do with chemical reactions in a living organism. Now, there's two types of metabolism. I don't mention the two types specifically, but the two types are anabolism and cat, uh, catabolism. Anabolism has to do with building something up or building larger compounds. Catabolism has to do with breaking down those compounds, but I'm just gonna use metabolism in general. Now, this chapter primarily, like I said, focuses on two components, and those two components will fall under the heading of energy utilization. Chapters nine and 10 will also fall under energy utilization. So if you notice here, these are the seven common properties, okay, that anything considered living must possess, must exhibit. And we're specifically right here, energy utilization. Now, when we get into chapter nine and 10, we'll talk about how there's some regulation and there's definitely order, okay? There's the series of chemical reactions, okay, that have to happen in a certain order. And it's proteins called enzymes that make sure that there is order, okay? As well as others that are responsible for regulation, control in other words. Energy itself is defined as the ability to perform or do work causing change, okay? That's how we define energy. Up here, what they're showing you are two types of living organisms that based on their ability to, uh, are based on how they're able to obtain energy, okay? They're classified into two groups. One group is known as producers, which is right here. Or let me erase that, I didn't do a good job. One group is known as producers, okay? This is the lay term, the simple term, for a group of living organisms known as autotrophs, okay? Autotrophs are living organisms that have the ability to take inorganic compounds and transform them into nutrients. Some of that nutrients serves as chemical energy, okay? If it's plants, which are autotrophs, if it's plants, which are autotrophs, well, plants, as well as any other organism that has chlorophyll in it, light absorbing pigments called chlorophyll, well, they're not only called autotrophs, they're called photoautotrophs. So in this case, what they're pointing to is in lay terms called a producer, but it's known not only as an autotroph, but a photoautotroph. Because these, this subset of autotrophs not only have the ability to take inorganic compounds, and transform them into nutrients, some of which serves as chemical energy, but they're able to capture a type of kinetic energy called light energy and redirect it into helping the organism produce those nutrients, again, some of which serves as chemical energy. Now, 
other organisms in general are classified into a distant group because they do not have the ability to produce their own nutrients. The lay term for them is consumers. The technical term for them is heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are living organisms they cannot produce their own nutrients, therefore they must consume other living organisms to obtain their nutrients, some of which serves as chemical energy. Okay. Therefore, the lay term is consumers. So you can see here it's showing you plants have the ability to harness or capture or use light energy. What they're not showing you here, and I'll show you in a little bit, is they also have the ability to take the inorganic compounds called CO2 and H2O or carbon dioxide and water and transform them into nutrients such as glucose, the carbohydrate glucose. Whereas heterotrophs or consumers don't have that ability, so they have to consume their nutrients. And as I said, for both types of organisms, in the end, some of that nutrients serves as chemical energy. Okay. Chemical energy is another term for potential energy. So if you look here on the next slide, there are two forms of energy. Kinetic energy, which is the energy of movement, and potential energy, which is stored energy. And there has to be potential energy for there to be kinetic energy. But since we are a cell and molecular biology class, instead of you hearing me say potential energy, I'm going to use the term chemical energy. But it's one in the same. So going back to this slide, what they're talking about here when they say chemical energy is they're showing you how these two different groups of organisms, photoautotrophs and autotrophs, okay, are obtaining their nutrients and how some of that nutrient serves as chemical energy. In other words, stored energy that will be used to do that will be used to do work. So this is how we start tying everything together. Now I'll let you look at this one. I've been meaning to get rid of this one. I don't really focus on it much, but I'll let you look at this one. This formula right here, cellular respiration, you're going to see a whole lot of it, and I'm going to dissect it in Chapter 9. So make sure you know this formula by heart. Sorry, everybody, I have my phone. I keep forgetting all the time. I get a lot of emails when I'm lecturing. <laughs> my phone keeps going off. Um, this formula here for cellular respiration, you're going to see it again in Chapter 9. It's called a formula, but technically speaking, it's more of a summary. All, right. All eukaryotic living organisms perform this process. Okay, Definitely all eukaryotic living organisms perform this process. Most of this process occurs in a membranous organelle called the mitochondria. And what occurs during cellular respiration is that cells take a type of chemical energy known as glucose and transform it into a different type of chemical energy known as ATP. So both of these here, okay, are sources of chemical energy. So if they both serve as sources of chemical energy, why can't a living organism such as a eukaryotic cell just use the glucose? It's already energy. Well, it's like the vehicles we drive. Some vehicles are hybrids. They run on electricity and gasoline. Some vehicles are not hybrids. They run strictly on gasoline or diesel. So what it is, is the reason for a cell needing this form of chemical energy known as ATP, well, that has to do with the compounds that do work in your cells. It has to do with proteins. Not every protein that does work in a cell is even going to need energy. Hopefully I remember how to spell everything, everybody. <laughs> but many proteins, okay, their primary source of energy is ATP. Now when we get into Chapter 9, I'm going to go over a couple of other sources of energy that some proteins use. But the number one fuel source for, the major for many proteins, for the majority of proteins, is this molecule of ATP. It's a type of chemical or potential energy that's derived from this type of potential or chemical energy, the nutrient glucose. Now down here, I won't ask you 
to identify this, but it does help to know, okay, the simple chemical structure of this type of chemical energy called ATP because of what we're going to talk about. Plus, I got a lot of questions about what ATP is. Well, the A in ATP stands for the base adenine, okay? It's covalently bonded to the sugar ribose. So if you remember your nucleic acids, right now it looks like we're talking about an RNA nucleotide, the sugar ribose with the base adenine. However, it's not a nucleotide. Because also covalently bonded to the sugar ribose are three functional groups that are all the same, three phosphate groups. Okay, so you're going to see in some of the figures, they're not going to keep showing you the entire structure of these phosphate groups. If you recall, I said the symbol for a phosphate group, and I hopefully I'll do this some justice, is an uppercase P, and this should be a circle, hopefully. Okay, it's not a circle, but you know, it should be a circle. <laughs> so I hope you all don't get tired of this goofy drawings of mine. you be a little laugh. But keep that in mind. You won't always see this kind of detail. They'll give you the uppercase P with a circle. Now, what scientists discovered is that this molecule, okay, is the way a cell stores energy. And it's not just stored anywhere in the molecule. What we're going to end up doing is focusing on a covalent bond that's roughly in, that's roughly in this area. Uh, let me do that again. Let me just bracket it. So that's roughly in this area. Okay. One of these covalent bonds here. So we're going to simplify it so we don't have to know which one exactly. But it's a covalent bond attaching a second phosphate group to a third. We're going to talk about that's how the cell stores its energy that can be used by other proteins. Now, as I said before, the reason why cells need energy is so proteins can use it to do their work. Proteins do different types of work. We talked about in chapter six, how the cytoskeleton uh, doesn't just function in structural support for the cell, but it also functions in trans uh, transport. There are motor proteins that use the microtubules of the cytoskeleton to move substances, or there are motor proteins involved in say a muscle contraction that are involved in producing movement, okay? They'll need energy. But we also talked about in chapter seven, how you have membrane proteins, transmembrane proteins, that do the work of transporting substances across the cell membrane if that substance needs to be moved into or out of the cell but can't get through the phospholipid bilayer, specifically the hydrophobic barrier. We talk about a type of carrier mediated transport called active transport. And I used an example of the glucose transporter. Now it doesn't look like this, the glucose transporter. It's not a channel protein, but it's a carrier protein. But in either case, we talked about how sometimes when a protein moves a substance across a cell membrane, it's moving that substance in the direction of a higher solute concentration. That's like swimming against the flow, swimming upstream. Therefore, that protein needs energy to go against the flow. In this case, we're here. This is where we're at for Chapter 8, right in here. Okay. I said metabolism is defined as chemical reactions in a living organism. In order for a chemical reaction to occur in a living organism, we need reactants. And these reactants will be converted to products. Okay. But I said what we're going to focus on, all right, mainly, are two areas in here to explain these chemical reactions. Let me go back here. What we're going to focus on initially is energy and the type of chemical reactions responsible for producing energy as well as using it. Okay. And then the other part, as I said, we're going to focus on uh, what actually needs that energy. In the case of this chapter, it's going to be proteins called enzymes. Right. Now, <clears throat> there are two energy laws. There's actually more than these two energy laws. Uh, my, one of my sons was telling me, who was a pre-engineering major, he says, Dad, you only cover two. I said, hey, we're biologists. We're not hardcore chemists and engineers. He started laughing at me, and I said, so we cover two of the laws. I believe it's up to four right now, but only these two. What I test you on these two laws is going to be straight off your notes in the PowerPoint here, okay? These laws are called the laws of thermodynamics, and there's two of them, simply called the first law of thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics, okay? Thermodynamics itself is defined as the study of energy transformation. What's an example of what we would study? If we want to study energy transformation or we want to go into thermodynamics, it's this 
process here, cellular respiration. We talk about this form of energy being transformed into what? ATP. Okay, so this is an example of what we mean by studying energy transformation. Again, there are two energy laws that are basic to understanding energy use patterns in cells. Why well, I said we're under that fifth property, energy utilization. Listen carefully. The first law of thermodynamics is focusing on chemical energy, potential energy. Okay. It talks about how energy can only be converted or transformed. In other words, there's no magic act going on here. Energy doesn't just appear out of nowhere. And when energy is used, it doesn't just vanish into nothing. The simplest way I can explain this is by combining two of the three energy producing processes we are going to talk about in chapter 9 and 10. Cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Okay. When we get into chapter 9, we're going to talk about in order for cellular respiration to occur, we need a nutrient. The preferred nutrient is a carbohydrate glucose. And we need an essential gas, oxygen, O2. Okay. When we have these two reactants, okay, a cell is eventually able to produce the type of energy that is needed by proteins inside of it to do work, to do cellular work, ATP. Now, there's a little energy that's lost. We'll talk about this heat energy in a second. Okay. But when the cell produces that ATP for proteins to do cellular work, it's like if you've ever cooked or made something. Okay, you're going to have some waste or maybe you'll have some leftovers that you'll store for later. Well, not only does the cell produce ATP, but it produces a little water and CO2. Water is harmless because we're two-thirds water. CO2 is a waste product. Our body needs to get rid of the vast majority of it. That's fine. Okay, Because the plant, when it performs photosynthesis, in addition to needing sunlight, it needs these two inorganic compounds, carbon dioxide and water. And with a combination of these three serving as reactants, it's able to produce two products, the product it wants to produce, the nutrient glucose, and the waste product, O2. So you can see here, okay, energy just doesn't vanish into nowhere when it's used, and it's not appearing from nowhere. So sometimes they refer to that first law of thermodynamics as energy conservation or the conservation of energy. The second law of thermodynamics, okay, if you notice here, the bear is moving. So the second law of thermodynamics is focusing on how chemical energy is converted into kinetic energy, energy of movement. So during every energy transfer or transformation, some energy is unusable and is often lost as heat. Okay, well, I was showing you here, it's showing you here. It's also showing you here for cellular respiration. Now, what also happens is whenever that chemical energy is being transformed, okay, or used, okay, to create kinetic energy, that's also going to create a little, if you want to call it chaos or simply disorder. Okay. Disorder or randomness, as they say, that is how we define entropy. It's a measure of disorder or randomness. Okay. So the way it works for a cell is that it needs proteins called enzymes to perform chemical reaction. But in turn, those enzymes need energy. Now, what the cell gets in return is that there are different types of enzymes that are responsible for specific types of chemical reactions. Some of them work directly together. Others don't work directly together. But in the end, okay, they all work in an organized manner. But in order to maintain that organization as they're producing the product using, okay, as they're producing the product, they're going to require some energy. They're going to require some fuel, okay? Because it's very easy for entropy to occur. It's very easy for what state to appear? Disorder, all right? So a cell wants to make sure that enzymes perform the correct chemical reactions when needed, resulting in the correct amount of product. But the cell wants to make sure that, hey, that available energy isn't just being haphazardly put to use, creating chaos and randomness. Okay, so when kinetic energy is happening, the cell is making sure, hey, I'm putting this to good use. Sometimes I kind of compare it to that day where you have a lot of energy and then you realize by the end of the day, you really didn't get anything productive done versus that day where you have a lot of energy and you actually got something productive done. You actually got your to-do list done.
But in order for a cell to, to offset that entropy and maintain order, it's going to require energy. Now, keep in mind, everybody's supposed to have had high school and or one semester of college level chemistry. All right. So if you haven't, you got to put in some extra time. Also, I need, uh, uh, how do you say, give, uh, give you all a reminder. I posted on Blackboard announcements. We have the tutoring hours I posted and how to schedule tutoring online. I also posted additional information, three additional links having to do with academic coaching. I was contacted by Joseph Lockwood, and he provided me with information about academic coaching. Okay, One of the links is a video giving you some background on it. Another one is a PDF giving you further background on it. And then another one uh, actually has jo Joseph Lockwood's uh, contact information on there. And basically, uh, they're supposed to take it to the next level. And they watch the video, and you'll see if you need help, OK? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the tutors have to, because uh, like at Hayes, uh, the tutor I recommend students to, his name is Daniel. He does both chemistry and biology. He has to know, or else he can't tutor you. <laughs> OK, Casey? So yeah, it's a good question. They have to be able to tutor you, OK? All right. Yeah, and if I don't know if Daniel, though, since since we're not meeting on campus, I don't know if Daniel's one of the tutors available, but the tutors they have available for this course should know how to work with Excel, okay? They should. All right. Now, if you look here, we talk about chemical reactions. Chemical reactions often rearrange bonds between atoms. And the way we do this is when we write out a chemical reaction, we write it out simple, okay? We use an arrow. What's to the left of the arrow or on the side of the arrow away from where it's pointing? Okay. These are referred to as the reactants. What's going to be acted on and transformed? I've been practicing. Oh, and then I jinxed myself. That should be a C. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to spend. <laughs> Let's put reactants here. Sorry. It started off good, and then I jinxed myself. All right. So on this side are our reactants. Now the catch is this. In biochem, okay, sometimes a reactant is called a substrate. All right, and I'll explain this more in a second. All right, so we start off, though, you have to know what reactants are. They are the substances that are acted on or required by an enzyme to produce a product. Over here to the left, I mean to the right, I'm sorry, in the direction the arrow is pointing, that's simply our product. Okay. Now we don't change that term other than whether it's singular or plural is it. See, I was thinking too much when I was writing reactant. Well, what we're going to focus on initially are two types of chemical reactions that have to do with synthesizing energy, chemical energy, and using that chemical energy to do work. One of these two types of chemical reactions falls under dehydration synthesis, the making of a covalent bond. The other type of chemical reaction having to do with energy falls under hydrolysis, the breaking of a covalent bond. Now, why do we go over those? Well, simply put, scientists discovered that a way a cell stores energy is through the formation of bonds. Not any bonds, but specifically covalent bonds. Okay? And the covalent bond, we're going to actually focus on a single covalent bond. The covalent bond we're going to focus on is the one associated with the molecule ATP, specifically the one attaching the third phosphate group to the second phosphate group of a molecule of ATP. Okay? So this is how cells are able to store energy. It's through the formation of chemical bonds, specifically covalent bonds. All right. So let me jump ahead here, and then I'll come back. So just focusing on this here. Ignore what's above it. We'll get to that in a second. Just focusing on this here. This is an example of what I said on the other slide. If you look here, they're showing you this bond right here. It's this bond between the second and the third phosphate group of a molecule of ATP, okay, that is the covalent bond that was made to store energy. Therefore, when a protein such as an enzyme needs fuel 
and it relies on ATP for that fuel or simply energy. What that enzyme will do is specifically hydrolyze or break this covalent bond, resulting in two products, adenosine diphosphate, only two phosphate groups, and what they often call an inorganic phosphate, but I just refer to as a phosphate group. But notice something here at the arrow. Unlike the previous chemical reaction I showed you, they show you in this case, when this covalent bond is broken in a molecule of ATP, it's to release that stored energy. But what they're not showing you is that, that stored energy in the case of this chapter is being used as fuel by proteins called enzymes. This is the abbreviation for enzyme, uppercase E-N-Z, okay? So I'll try to add this on more here. Now, there's a professor by the name of J. Willard Gibbs. He's a professor at Yale. And in 1978, and he, he had good intentions, everybody. I looked up the history on him because my professors never explained, you know, even where he was from. They just talked about Gibbs free energy. But when I looked it up, they said his intentions were well met. He was trying to simplify the explanation for the laws of thermodynamics. And I know myself and all my other fellow undergraduate and even graduate students to this day don't believe anything was simplified. But hey, he gave it a shot. But this professor from Yale, Gibbs, he defined a function called Gibbs free energy. So if you notice, a little side effect is he created mortality for himself. Okay. But in all seriousness, Gibbs free energy, it is defined as a living system's energy that can do work when temperature and pressure are uniform. Okay. Well, living system. What's an example of a living system? A living cell. So you could rewrite this definition to say Gibbs free energy is defined as a living cell's energy that can do work when temperature and pressure are uniform, okay? That's the way we're going to approach it in this chapter, All right? Now, <clears throat> energy here, what type of energy are they talking about? Well, I'm going to abbreviate this. They're talking about potential or chemical energy, okay? How much available chemical energy is there? for proteins to use so they can do their work. Then the last part is temperature and pressure. Well, think about it. If we're talking about cells of our body being the living systems, okay, then what is the temperature going to be? Roughly 37 degrees what? Celsius. And then air pressure. What is air pressure? I forgot. 760, 780. Oh, I should know that. Millimeters of mercury. So what we meet, what I'm getting at here is you can replace uniform with the word constant or unchanging. Jeez. Sorry, but I'm getting older and older. And, you know, there was a point there where I finally thought I got texting down. I'm that old. <laughs> yeah, I need a tutor. <laughs> now, I, I need somebody to write for me. <laughs> that would be even better. I think I'm hopeless. But um, so what we mean by uniform is constant or unchanging, okay? So this is the way we're going to approach it. So Gibbs free energy is defined as a living system or a living cell's energy that can do work when temperature and pressure are uniform. Okay, an example of temperature is the easiest one to explain what we mean by uniform or constant. Our body temp needs to be at 37 degrees. Now, on this next slide, okay, instead of writing out Gibbs free energy all the time, we simply use the letter G. The uppercase letter G is the symbol representing Gibbs free energy. So you don't have to keep writing it out, okay? And it's energy that's available to do what? To do work. Now, <clears throat> what, what happened next is Gibbs took the next step. He said, if you look at the first law of thermodynamics, we talk about how chemical energy or potential energy, it doesn't appear out of nowhere and it doesn't disappear to any, you know, vanish after it's used. At the same time when it's used, we transition into the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, uh, that chemical energy, when it's put to use to do work, that can lead to entropy. Therefore, a cell needs so a lot of that energy, uh, or th therefore, proteins that use that energy have to maintain order to prevent entropy from increasing. Now, so therefore, Gibbs said, hey, look, okay, 
we can uh, he can he said I'll create a formula to where you can calculate the change in available energy or Gibbs free energy after a chemical reaction occurs. So that formula initially was written out as delta G equals G of the final state minus G of the initial state. Listen carefully, everybody. This right here, delta, this letter delta here, it means change. If you're going to take biochem or it really, you see it in science classes a lot, your upper level classes. If you see that delta, okay, especially in chemistry, automatically tell yourself we're talking about change. Something's going to change. In this case, delta G is defined as the change in free energy after a chemical reaction has occurred. So the formula I want you to know going into the test is not this one up here, but know this one here. Because keep in mind, we're not only doing chemistry for biologists, but we're going to try to do biochem for biologists, everybody. Okay, the difference between chem and biochem, well, bio means living. So you're talking about chemical reactions in a living organism. So if you look here, we can rewrite the equation to where now the change in Gibbs free energy, delta G, equals the amount of free energy in the products minus the amount of free energy in the reactants. Keep in mind, delta G means Gibbs free energy. Okay. So if you look at this reaction down here, all right, notice something. We start off with ATP, and we end up with ADP plus P. And they show you up here what's happening during this chemical reaction. So what I'm getting at is we actually don't have to have numerical data if all we want to know is after a chemical reaction occurred, did a cell actually end up with products that are rich in energy? Or after a chemical reaction occurred, does a cell now have actually less energy? In other words, does the available energy in the cell increase or decrease after the chemical reaction? Well, if you look here, ATP is a product rich in energy compared to what? These two here. How do we know? Well, they're showing you here. When ATP undergoes a chemical reaction, when it's used by a protein to do work, okay, one of the covalent bonds is broken, we end up with two smaller molecules that are very low in energy. They're described as having such a low state of energy they can't be used by any of the proteins. Energy here is being released. Therefore, in this case, the products, which are over here, have less energy than the what? Reactants. So just knowing the product is low in energy and the reactant is high in energy, now you can predict at the very least that the change in Gibbs free energy is going to be what? Negative. Cell's going to have less. Okay. Now, Why do I say this? Because I want to move into the next part. Okay. Listen carefully. When we are talking about chemical reactions having to do with producing chemical energy and using that chemical energy to do work, okay, we call these chemical reactions endergonic reactions and exergonic reactions. But keep in mind what I said. Scientists discovered that a way a cell stores energy is through the formation of a covalent bond between the second phosphate group and the third phosphate group of a molecule of ATP. Therefore, scientists discovered that when a protein wants, needs to use the energy stored in that molecule of ATP to do work, it's going to break that same covalent bond releasing the third phosphate group from the rest of the molecule left over called ADP, okay? So in other words, what they're not showing you here is that when the molecule of ATP is being used to do work or when the molecule of ATP is being made, synthesized, what you can see here is it's tied into making and breaking a covalent bond between the second and third phosphate group. Therefore, endergonic reactions, first of all, Endergonic reactions, you could place them under dehydration synthesis. And endergonic reactions going to involve 
forming a covalent bond between the second phosphate group of ADP and this phosphate group here. And when that covalent bond is formed, that's how the cell is storing its energy. Therefore, ATP is considered a type of chemical energy. But the definition for an endergonic reaction is actually an endergonic reaction absorbs free energy from its surroundings and it is non-spontaneous. In other words, we need enzymes to make this happen. Okay, they have to be able to make this happen because we are working with molecules that are not energy rich. Okay, So there has to be something physically there to do this process, to carry out this reaction. Okay, so, Well, it says here, endergonic reactions absorb free energy. Well, I just said that's another, I just said that when a covalent bond is made, creating this molecule of ATP, that's how the cell is storing energy. All right, so absorbs free energy is another way of saying storing energy when forming that covalent bond. However, what's the purpose of making chemical energy in the form of ATP? So that proteins, in this case, proteins that perform chemical reactions called enzymes have chemical energy available so that they can do what type of work? Cellular work. Therefore, enzymes, and it's not understood how they do this, but enzymes themselves, they perform endergonic reactions. They also perform exergonic reactions. When an enzyme wants to utilize the energy stored in ATP, all right, they're going to have to perform an endergonic reaction. Endergonic reactions, the technical definition is they proceed, endergonic reaction proceeds with the net release of free energy and is spontaneous, energy favorable. In other words, we have a molecule that's rich in energy, okay? And it's kind of like that day where you wake up and you have a lot of energy. There's a good chance something, what's going to happen spontaneous? Hopefully it's productive. Okay, so this molecule is rich in energy and enzyme is going to take advantage of that. So an endergonic reaction would fall under reactions called hydrolysis reactions but they're not showing you here is that the enzyme will grab onto this ATP and break that covalent bond holding the third phosphate group to the rest of this molecule. When that bond is broken, that results in the release of energy, as it says up here, net release. Okay. What they didn't show you here is that energy is being captured by the enzyme and used as fuel to do cellular work. So this is another way of explaining everything and now adding in the covalent bonds as well as changes in Gibbs free energy. So chemical reactions in cells and energy. When an intergonic reaction happens, delta G should be positive because the product should end up being richer in energy than the reactant. So this bottom here on the x-axis is just the direction the react chemical reaction is going. But you can see up here where it says free energy, energy is being absorbed or input during the formation of the chemical bond. Okay, so delta G should be positive because the product is richer in energy than the reactant. But what is actually going on? Covalent bonds are being formed as a means for storing energy resulting in this molecule called ATP. Exergonic reactions, as we said, we're going in the opposite direction. Exergonic reactions, the reactants are much richer in free energy than the products. Is this a bad thing? No. Because what they don't show you here is what's actually going on is it's a protein that's grabbing onto a molecule of ATP, breaking the covalent bond so that it can release the energy it's going to capture to do work. However, we start with ATP, we end up with products ADP plus P, and they're going to, products in this case have less energy than the reactants. If we go back to the formula, delta G equals G of the product minus G of the reactant, now we end up with delta G being what? negative. The reactants had more free energy. What's actually happening in regards to chemical bonds? Well, covalent bonds being broken to release that stored energy. Okay. So for exergonic reactions, not only should delta G be negative, the reactants richer in energy than the products, but since the reactants are rich in energy, we say these type of chemical reactions are more spontaneous, more energetically favorable, Okay, because there's so much extra energy to do work. Therefore, which of these two types of chemical reactions associated with the making and using of chemical energy is important? Endergonic versus exergonic? They're both equally important. 
So a cell actually couples these two types of chemical reactions. Both are equally important. Endergonic reactions producing products rich in energy. So in this case, the product they're talking about, I want you to think of it as being ATP. Okay. On this side, when an exergonic reaction happens and energy is being released, well, now the products they're showing you over here, you want to be, they're referring to these products. Okay. So bottom line is this half of the circular figure here represents the endergonic. This half here represents the exergonic. Okay, so we apply these type of chemical reactions to the synthesizing of chemical or making of chemical energy and then they're utilizing or using chemical energy. They're both equally important. Well, why do we go over energy so much? It has to do with enzymes. First of all, enzymes are proteins and they're responsible for catalyzing not just any chemical reaction, but specific chemical reactions. Okay, so you'll see this some in this chapter, and I'll definitely, uh, you'll have a few enzymes, specific types of enzymes you'll be responsible for in chapter nine when we focus on cellular respiration, just to get this message across, okay? Just like there's, just like not all proteins are the same in regards to that they all do the same type of work, right? We talked about some proteins function as membrane receptors, some proteins function as CAMs or cell adhesion molecules, some folks, uh, proteins function as in uh, membrane transport, such as channel or carrier proteins. And then there are those proteins that are responsible for catalyzing chemical reactions. We call them enzymes. But cells need different types of chemical reactions to be catalyzed to produce different types of products so that the cell as a whole can function, okay? Therefore, as, as we go through this chapter and into the other chapters, we'll talk about how enzymes are given different names related to those specific chemical reactions they are responsible for catalyzing. And I will go over, okay, how sometimes you can recognize when they're talking about an enzyme, okay, based on the name they've given that enzyme. And we'll get to this as we go. Now, enzymes are proteins that efficiently catalyze specific chemical reactions. Down here is a very popular digestive enzyme. If you take an AMP class, you go over the digestive system, you should be introduced to this. There are cells in the stomach, okay, that synthesize and release a digestive enzyme called pepsin. If you look up here, use this as a little review. Relate this back to chapter five, okay? Notice there are different colors representing different polypeptides that have come together in a folded state forming a quaternary protein structure. Also, if you look, you can see these flat arrows going in opposite directions. Never mind that they're different colors, but you can see them going in opposite directions. Well, that represents secondary structures of proteins. These are beta sheets. If you look over here and you look over here, two different colors, but they both represent secondary structures called alpha helices. Why am I pointing this out? So you know what the heck you're looking at. You're looking at a protein, an active protein known as pepsin. Pepsin is a digestive enzyme. Now, as I said before, I'm going to talk about how uh, often you can tell when they're talking about not just a protein, but a protein that functions as an enzyme. However, it's not 100% true. Pepsin is one of them. Okay, pepsin itself, ironically, it's a digestive enzyme. Therefore, it's a protein, but its job is to break down other proteins. Okay, so just to give you a little introduction there, its job is just to break down proteins. Now, proteins that function as enzymes, as I said, they catalyze specific chemical reactions. Therefore, that means that they act on specific reactants, except whatever a protein enzyme directly binds to, grabs onto, and transforms, we no longer call it just a reactant. We more specifically call it a substrate or substrates. So listen carefully. All substrates are reactants, but not all reactants are substrates, okay? So if I ask you a question and I mention enzymes and what they act on, even if I give you the choice reactant and substrate, you would just choose substrate because that's specifically what they act on and grab to. That may not be all that the enzyme needs to carry out the chemical reaction. So reactants is a general term. But whichever reactant 
is the one bound to and transformed by the enzyme, that's the one we call the substrate. So down here, if you recall, I said in general, a protein shape is directly related to its function. What they found is that proteins are a lot like you and I. When they do work, they have to get physical. They have to physically interact with what they have to transform or change. Okay. So here, or I'm sorry, in chapter seven, I mentioned glucose transporter. Okay. I'm sorry, glucose transporter didn't perform active transport. I'm sorry, glucose transporter performs a type of passive transport called facilitated diffusion. I misspoke earlier in the lecture. Uh, so it performs a type of passive transporter process called facilitated diffusion. But when you go over that glucose transporter in Chapter 7, okay, it talks about how there's a receptor site, and I mentioned it's a binding site. It's a part of the protein, okay, that has a shape that complements the molecule it was responsible for transporting across the cell membrane, which was glucose. We talked about how that glucose transporter at its binding site, when it binds to glucose, that triggers that protein to change its shape while still staying in the cell membrane, but that allows glucose to diffuse from a high to low concentration. Thus, it's facilitated diffusion. Again, remember, I misspoke before. It's passive process. Well, that's comparable to these proteins that are called enzymes. Okay. It's important they have the correct shape because there is a region of the enzyme that will directly bind and come in contact with that reactant that we call a substrate. This region is called the active site, which is right in here. All this represents the active site. The active site is going to have a shape to it that complements the shape of the substrates. So notice here. Okay, so not the entire protein is going to come in contact with those reactants called substrates that it directly binds. All right. Okay, so this area called the active site is not only the site that directly binds to reactants called substrates, but it's also the site that's going to catalyze the chemical reaction resulting in the production of the product. But it's important that overall it has a certain shape to ensure the active site has a certain shape. Okay, So the active site has a shape that complements the shape of reactants called substrates. They show you here that the enzyme binds these two substrates at its active site. But notice something else. Look at the shape of the enzyme. You can see the shape of the enzyme changed once it bound, once it, uh, bound to the substrates. This has been found to occur with enzymes. Whenever they bind to reactants called substrates at their active sites, the enzymes will change their shape, tightening their grip on these reactants called substrates, and then catalyzing a chemical reaction to convert them to products. When the enzyme at its active site binds to the substrate and changes shape where it looks like it's tightening its grip or biting down on the substrate, Okay, we call this process induced fit. So proteins are a lot like you and I, okay, in that in the or enzymes are a lot like you and I in that they are going to have to have some movement or fluidity. Now some proteins have to be uh, how do you say more stagnant, not much of any movement, but many proteins in general, including enzymes, they have to be able to change shape in order to do their job, okay. So that's what's happening here in this case. When that enzyme, specifically at a region called the active site, binds to the substrate, the overall enzyme is going to bite down or tighten its grip on the substrate, and we call this induced fit. But again, why is it doing that? Why is it changing shape, tightening its grip on these reactants called substrate? It's so it can catalyze the chemical reaction producing the products. Now, what they're not showing you here is that whenever the enzyme produces the products, we actually don't want the shape of these products to perfectly fit into this active site anymore because we want the enzyme to do what? Let go of the products. Okay. So there's more to it than just than what they're showing you here, but this is good enough for the class here that we're talking about. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that gives free energy we talked about in a living system. In other words, the amount of a uh, uh, free energy available for uh, to do work in a cell. Well, that energy is often referred to as 
activation energy. The symbol for activation energy is uppercase E with the subscript uppercase A. Okay. So if you hear the term activation energy, we're talking about the amount of free energy available to do work. So where the line here is dotted, they're showing you this is our EA, our available free energy that's available to convert reactants into a product. The problem with that, though, is that researchers said is that if a cell didn't have a proteins called enzymes to catalyze chemical reactions, okay, the cell would have to wait. The cell would have to wait for enough energy to spontaneously appear for a chemical reaction to occur. And then on top of that, the chemical reaction would be random. That's neither one of those is going to allow a cell, not just the function, neither one of those is going to allow a cell, neither one of those characteristics is going to allow a cell to even survive. Okay, therefore, what they found is proteins ensure, okay, chemical reactions are going to occur. All right. And not only are they going to assure, ensure that not just any chemical reaction occurs, but specific chemical reactions that will allow the cell to survive and function properly are going to occur because they are going to make sure they catalyze re reactions. Now, these proteins are going to need enzyme, but the I mean, are going to need energy. I'm sorry, but these enzymes are going to need a lot less activation energy or excess available energy. So they're going to perform these processes very efficiently. So it says here, enzymes lower the amount of activation energy. In other words, above the dotted line here is the amount of excess energy available to catalyze a chemical reaction, except in this case, the enzyme is going to make sure it makes it happen. So not only is it lowering the amount of energy that needs to be available to cause a chemical reaction to occur, but they are going to catalyze the chemical reaction, and it's going to be a specific chemical reaction, one needed by the cell. It's anything but random, and this is extremely important. Now, when we get into Chapter uh, 9, you're going to, I'll point it out, okay, not every single enzyme needs energy in the form of ATP to do its work, okay, but I'll show you some that do. And we already talked about one in Chapter 7, but it wasn't the glucose transporter, which performs facilitated diffusion. It was another transmembrane protein, a carrier protein called the sodium-potassium exchange pump. That carrier protein did need energy in the form of ATP to transport substances across the cell membrane. But here's a different group not involved in membrane transport, but they also can use uh, energy called enzymes. Now, these next two figures, DNase and sucrase, these are both enzymes. They're both digestive enzymes. Now, the reason why I chose these two enzymes is actually to explain, if you want to call it the nomenclature, where do they come up with the names of en for enzymes? This isn't true for all enzymes, but it's true for a significant or a majority of the enzymes. If a biochemist wants you to know, they're not just talking about proteins, but they're talking about proteins that are enzymes. Okay. They often give that enzyme a name that ends in ASE. Okay. So there is a digestive enzyme produced by cells of the pancreas released into your small intestines. These digestive enzymes are known as DNAs. Okay. The ASC lets you know they're enzymes. They're going to catalyze chemical reactions that are hydraulic chemical reactions. Okay. The first part of the name, which actually technically overlaps, has to do with not just the reactant, but more specifically what it directly binds to, the substrate. It's responsible for digesting or breaking down DNA. Thus, they give it the name DNA. It's real simple. Then we have sucrase. Again, they want you to know they're not just talking about proteins, but proteins that catalyze chemical reactions called enzymes. Often, they'll give that enzyme a name that ends in ASE. And again, in this case, this enzyme gets the first half of its name from the substrate it acts on. Okay. Sucrase is another digestive enzyme produced by our pancreas, at least into our small intestines. It has an active site that complements the shape of the disaccharide sucrose, common table sugar. Once it binds to that disaccharide, 
okay, it will catalyze a chemical reaction. That's a type of hydrolysis reaction, breaking the covalent bond, thus producing two monosaccharides. So this is often where the names come. Now in the next chapter, when we get into cellular respiration, okay, uh, there are going to be a few enzymes you need to know, and I'll try to go give you some, uh, um, how you say, go over where the names are coming from, and hopefully that'll help you remember, okay, why they name these enzymes this way and where they come into play during this process of cellular respiration. Now, the way it works in our cells is enzymes often work in groups, and you'll see this again in Chapter 9 right away, okay? Enzymes often work in groups carrying out a chain of chemical reactions. Sometimes instead of chain, you might hear a biochemist or scientist in general use the word series. In other words, what they found is enzymes often work in groups, okay? And they work in a certain order. So the way it works in this case, when they work in groups, they work in a certain order. So therefore, one of the enzymes will be enzyme one, okay? It's responsible for the first chemical reaction. If it does not perform that chemical reaction, the other enzymes that are working together with it in a series won't be able to do anything. Okay, so it's showing you here an example of what we mean by enzymes often work in groups to carry out a chain or series of chemical reactions. We have our reactant, or more specifically our substrate, recognized by enzyme 1, bound by enzyme 1 at its active site, and it converts this substrate to a product B. What is the product produced by enzyme 1 now serves as a substrate for enzyme 2. Enzyme 2 at its active site will bind this substrate B converting it to product C. Now, what is a product produced by enzyme C is actually a substrate bound at the active site by enzyme 3. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't know if I said that right. Product produced by enzyme 2 serves as a substrate, okay, acted on by enzyme 3. And then enzyme 3 will convert it to the final product needed by the cell, which in this case is product D. You see this very commonly. In physiology, they'll use the terms chemical pathways. So you'll hear chain of chemical reactions, series of chemical reactions, or you may hear chemical pathway. In either case, now you're talking about a group of enzymes that are working together similar to this, everybody. Okay. Now, what we're going to transition into next are factors that affect enzyme activity. Okay. What I'm talking about is something in the environment that will either help activate an enzyme so that it will catalyze a chemical reaction or there's something in the environment that will enhance an enzyme's activity. In other words, the enzyme can work when the environment's not ideal for it, but it much prefer, say, a certain pH or temperature so it can work much better at a higher level of activity. And then sometimes there are factors in the environment that inhibit enzyme function. Now, inhibit or inhibition is defined as the slowing down, preventing, uh, the slowing down, stopping, or preventing enzyme function. So when a factor inhibits enzyme function, the enzyme may still be active, it's just less active. Or when a factor inhibits an enzyme, it completely stops its activity. It shuts it off. Or sometimes a factor inhibits an enzyme by never letting it get started. And this is what we're going to get to when we get to the uh, as we go through these factors. So there are six factors that contribute to enzyme or affect enzyme activity. Okay, some are positive, some are negative. Cofactors, chelators, temperature, pH. Substrate concentration, remember the brackets I said in this class, when I use the brackets, that means concentration. I don't want to have to keep writing it out, okay? And then inhibitors. When we go over inhibitors, we're, act, we're actually going to be referring to molecules, two different types of molecules. They both inhibit enzyme function, okay, but they do it in different, slightly different ways. Okay. Cofactors. What scientists discovered is that in order for an enzyme, or in order for many enzymes to become active, they need cofactors, 
Okay, so again, what scientists discovered is that many enzymes, in order to become active, need cofactors. What they discovered is one of the reasons why enzymes, some enzymes need cofactors to become active is because sometimes the cofactors contribute to an enzyme taking on the ideal shape or how do you say folding completely into its correct shape so that it now can catalyze a chemical reaction. There are other reasons for it, but this is one of the main ones. Now, there are different types of cofactors, okay? But these cofactors, I want you to go by what I have, and this is based on how we used to use them in the lab. Examples of cofactors that I gave you in your notes are calcium ions, okay? magnesium, ions, and then the last ones are on this figure here, but I'm only going to use one of them, copper ions. Okay. Well, if you notice something, <clears throat> I'm approaching this a little different from the text. Okay, this is the way I want you to know it. These are three examples of cofactors. Cofactors that have been found to be required by enzymes to help the enzyme, okay, how do you say, uh, finish folding into the correct shape so that it can catalyze a chemical reaction. If you remove these cofactor, a cofactor away from an enzyme, a particular cofactor it needs from an enzyme, then what happens is the enzyme doesn't completely unfold, but it loses its shape enough to where it can't catalyze a chemical reaction. Now, if you notice, all three of these cofactors, okay, are actually cations. Ca2+, plus, Mg2+, plus, they're all ions, but they're cations, okay? Not all cations function as cofactors, but many cofactors are cations, and those are the most popular cofactors you hear about. That's why I said don't, don't go by all the technical additional stuff the text gives you. This is commonly what you see in research labs and everything. When they talk about cofactors, these are three of the most popular, okay? cations that also function as cofactors. Now down here, you can see here, there's an enzyme. Its full name is polyphenol oxidase. Thus, in science, they love to give them long names and then turn around and use abbreviations, okay? Its simpler name is the abbreviation PPO. Polyphenol oxidase is an enzyme produced, okay, by plants, specifically the fruit part of the plant, okay, such as bananas. And if you recall with bananas, if you remove the peel and you expose the fleshy tissue, the part we usually eat, to the atmosphere, okay, in particular O2, okay, uh, will start having a negative effect. And the banana starts to turn what color? Brown. Well, that brown is actually a defensive, in part, a defensive mechanism, okay, against microbes. And what's producing that brown color is this enzyme, PPO, polyphenol oxidase. Now, what researchers found is that polyphenol oxidase requires a cofactor. They give you two, but in teaching labs, the one we focus on is this one. Okay. Polyphenol oxidase requires cofactors that are copper ions. If you remove, if you take these copper ions away from PPO, it's not able to completely fold into the correct shape. Therefore, it's not able to catalyze the chemical reaction it needs to catalyze. Therefore, the fruit doesn't turn brown. But as I said, in actuality, the browning of the fruit is kind of a defense mechanism. Now, this is what we found. So by simply removing these cofactors, the enzyme no longer works. Okay. So this is one of the examples of what I mean by cofactors help activate an enzyme. Okay, by binding to the enzyme, helping the enzyme, such as PPO, fold completely into its correct shape, and now it's capable of catalyzing a chemical reaction. Now, chelators. The way it works for chelators is that chelators remove, God, that's so bad. 
chelators remove cations. Okay, that's just in general what they do. Okay, I give up. I'm just going to say it. Okay. <laughs> so chelators remove cations from a solution. Therefore, what scientists discovered is if they have a solution that contains the enzyme, the reactants, including the substrate it needs, it has the energy it needs, but it also needs a cofactor. What scientists discovered is that if, in addition, if they add a chelator to that solution, okay, that chelator is going to remove cations. And if one of those cations just happens to serve as a cofactor for the enzyme, the enzyme won't work. There are different types of chelators. Two types of chelators I've given you here, EDTA and PTU. I had students asking me, what does EDTA and PTU stand for? So here it is. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It's a hit and miss for me. Okay. You can see here for PTU, a little simpler, uh, phenolthiourea. But you see this a lot in science. Now, the way it works is EDTA. EDTA removes calcium and magnesium ions from a solution. So if this chelator, EDTA, is present, okay, sorry about all this so bad. My mouth, my pad, I'm going to use an excuse, my pad's moving around too. So what happens is EDTA is a chelator that removes calcium ions and magnesium ions from a solution. So if you have an enzyme, okay, that has everything it needs, but then somebody decides, a scientist decides to add EDTA, say in an experiment, scientist has an enzyme, and the enzyme has everything it needs, including the cofactor. It needs calcium or magnesium ions as a cofactor. But then the scientist adds a chelator, such as EDTA. What will happen is the EDTA will remove both the calcium and magnesium ions. And if that enzyme happens to need them, now the enzyme doesn't have them. The enzyme, therefore, can't fold completely into the correct shape it needs to catalyze a chemical reaction. Therefore, it cannot catalyze it. So in the end, by chelators removing cations, they therefore can remove cofactors. The result, inhibition of enzyme function. Okay, so again, because chelators can remove cations, Therefore, they can remove cofactors. This results in enzyme inhibition. PTU down here, okay, it's known for removing, and I'm not going to even try, I'm just going to put the ion, the, uh, ion. PTU here, it's known for being able to remove copper ions from a solution. We don't do this with y'all, and I don't know why, but with our non-majors, they actually perform an experiment, an enzyme experiment. And what they use is they use these two chelators, PTU and EDTA. They put them into a solution with the enzyme PPO. And then they give PPO everything else it needs to catalyze the chemical reaction. They give it the reactants, including the reactant that serves as a substrate, but they'll add both of these chelators in separate tubes, separately, the chelators. And what the students end up finding out is that whenever the enzyme has everything it needs, but the chelator EDTA is added, it doesn't affect the enzyme. Because this enzyme PPO needs copper ions. So it's, un it's unaffected by calcium and magnesium ions being removed. The enzyme does its job, produces a product. However, in the test tube that the students have the enzyme as well as the reactants and substrates and everything that the enzyme needs to produce the product, but now the students add the other chelator, PTU, this chelator, PTU, removes the copper ions from the solution. And what the students notice is that now, all of a sudden, the enzyme doesn't produce any product. So through process of elimination, by using PTU to remove these copper ions from the solution, which are no longer available for the enzyme PPU, PPO, this results in enzyme inhibition. It can't work. It's not active. Okay. Now, normally you don't see chelators 
uh, until you, uh, if you go into a research lab or grad school or you work for a tech company, you might see them, okay? Now, third factor that can affect enzyme function, temperature, okay? Think about it for us. What is the body temp for us humans, homo sapiens? 37 degrees Celsius, okay? Well, it's been found that that is the No, no, actually it can regain them, um, but the way we do the lab experiments, at least in a test tube, is normally once we add them all together, that's it for the enzyme, we get rid of it. But in theory, if you could extract the chelator back out of the solution and leave behind the cofactors, the enzyme should more than likely be able to regain its function. Does that help, Casey? Okay. All right, so here for enzyme temperature, a lot of people don't know this. Okay. One of the major reasons, if not the major reason, why it's important that our body temp, okay, be maintained at a constant 37 degrees Celsius has to do with the fact that that is the optimal temperature for the enzymes of our body. That's not 100% true for pH, but it is true for enzyme function. Okay. So, what they found is that the various enzymes that do work in the cells of our body, they work best at an optimal temp of 37 degrees Celsius. Now, this is the catch. Optimal temp doesn't mean that this is a temperature that the enzyme is going to produce the large amount of product at. Optimal temperature means this is a temperature that the enzyme works best with by not only catalyzing specific chemical reactions, but catalyzing those chemical reactions at a rate that produces the amount of product or the concentration of product that a cell needs. So that's the catch with our enzymes. When we say this is an optimal temp for an enzyme, we're not talking about, hey, the enzyme can produce a large quantity, okay, or a large concentration of product for the cell. Optimal temp, you got to think of as being more of now the enzyme not only can catalyze the specific react chemical reaction it's responsible for, but it's also going to produce a certain concentration of product, okay, that the cell needs. Not too much, not too little, okay. However, there are organisms, okay, there are organisms that um, <clears throat> don't do well at that temperature. This shouldn't be bacteria. I keep forgetting to change this, okay. Uh, what should we call it? Right here, this right here, thermophilic is in reference to thermophile. If you go back to chapter one, okay, if you remember I talked about halophiles and thermophiles, they fall into the domain archaea. So this is a little outdated here. But listen carefully, not every living organism, okay, um, has a body temp, if you want to call it, 37 degrees Celsius. There are unicellular prokaryotic organisms that fall into the domain archaea. This group is known as thermophiles. Now, there are different species or genuses of thermophiles, but collectively they're called thermophiles, okay? And they're called thermophiles because they have been found to live at temperatures well above our body temps. In this case, some of them have been found to live at temperatures ranging anywhere from 77 degrees Celsius to as high as over 100 degrees Celsius. Remember, that's boiling temple water, but they've been found to thrive. Now, what they found for these organisms is, in addition to, obviously, their structural makeup, it's got to have something special to, to uh, survive at such a high temp. What else they found out is that for these thermophiles, okay, such as those that live at 77 degrees Celsius, the enzymes in those thermophiles, they thrive at these temperatures. 77 degrees is actually their optimal temp. So another way to explain this is, here's a technique you're gonna, uh, we're gonna have introduce in lab later. It's called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, okay? Polymerase chain reaction uh, requires three different temperatures to catalyze DNA replication in a tube. In other words, copying DNA, all right? All three temperatures are well above 37 degrees Celsius. As a matter of fact, the lowest temp I ever used for PCR was 59 degrees Celsius, okay? 
In addition to that, the very first temperature you use is above 90 degrees. The last, there's three different temps. The last temperature you use is roughly 72 degrees, okay, to catalyze DNA replication in a tube. So when the idea was developed on paper, the problem was actually implementing it. At the time, the enzyme responsible for making copies of DNA, okay, the enzyme that was responsible for doing it and that had been produced in a test tube and used for experiments, the problem with that enzyme is that this was its optimal temp. And if you expose the enzyme at the time to a temp such as 59 degrees or 77 degrees or definitely 90 degrees Celsius, it would denature, okay, the enzyme. High temps can denature proteins, cause them to unfold. So when scientists discovered there were organisms that not only lived but thrived very high temps, such as next to volcanic vents, uh, say in the ocean, that they came to call thermophiles, they not only studied them, okay, but he, they also focused in on the enzymes and specifically the enzyme responsible for DNA replication in these living organisms. Okay. One of these organisms was, no, was uh, named Thermophilus aquaticus. In that unicellular prokaryotic organism, they identified the enzyme responsible for DNA replication and they isolated it. They managed to produce a synthetic form of that enzyme and they called it TAC polymerase. The T coming from Thermophilus, the AQ coming from its species name, Aquaticus, they called it TAC polymerase. This was a huge advancement in research because now they could take this enzyme that did DNA replication, okay, from this organism, but it performed DNA replication at higher temps. And even if you exposed it to temps that it normally wasn't around above 90 degrees, it was resistant to denaturation. Okay, so researchers go out and study this, but normally if you look at an organism and you identify its body temp, automatically tell yourself that body temp is tied into enzyme function. Now, in general, the way it works, enzymes exposed to high temps above the normal temps at which they work will cause the enzymes to denature. They will unfold, and it's rare that they can refold. However, enzymes that are exposed to temps below body temp, it's been found that they can stay active, it's just their level of activity decreases, it slows down. But if you bring the temp back up to optimal temp, it's been found that the enzymes will regain their normal function in contrast to ex if you expose them to high temperatures. Now, pH. Enzymes also require an optimal pH. And what I'm gonna use here is just the nuts. Okay, notice they tell you here, the stomach, and here, the intestines. Here's that enzyme I introduced to you called pepsin. There's another enzyme called trypsin. Both of these are enzymes, okay? So remember what I said. I, I didn't say all the time. I said often they will give an enzyme a name that ends in ASC, but it's not 100% of the time, okay? Both of these enzymes right here are classified under a larger title or group of enzymes that all break down proteins. They call them proteases. So you don't see the ASE ending until they put them under a larger group title. Okay. Pepsin and trypsin. Pepsin and trypsin are classified under a larger category uh, proteins that break down other proteins. In other words, they're all digestive enzymes, but they digest specifically other proteins, so they call them proteases. You will find these digestive enzymes being produced by cells in your digestive tract. However, pepsin is produced by cells of the stomach. Trypsin is actually produced by cells of the pancreas, but it's released into your intestines, your small intestines. And what has been found is that the pH in the stomach Okay, the pH of the stomach is very acidic, roughly about a pH of 2, as opposed to the intestines. In the intestines, 
the pH of the surrounding environment is approximately 8. What they found out is for both of these enzymes, the optimal temperature that they work at is 37 degrees Celsius. But the optimal pH, okay, that they work best at is different. Pepsin works best at an acidic pH. Therefore, not only do you have cells that produce this digestive enzyme pepsin, but you have cells in the stomach that actually synthesize and secrete the acid hydrochloric acid. Pepsin works great at that acidic pH. The problem is the content in your stomach that's being broken down by the acids and the enzyme pepsin, okay, that pH of that environment, as it moves from your stomach into your small intestines, the cells that line the wall of your small intestines, as well as the enzymes produced by the pancreas and released into your small intestines, none of it likes this acidic pH. So in addition to your pancreas synthesizing and releasing digestive enzymes into your small intestines, enzymes such as trypsin, the pancreas will also rele release buffers to neutralize the acidic pH or simply raise the pH in the small intestines to 8. Why 8? Because not only do these enzymes not like an acidic pH such as trypsin, they work best at roughly a pH of H also. So it's a combination, neutralize the acid, but also make sure that the pH is brought up to an ideal pH that trypsin works best at. So they're both proteases. They both are digestive enzyme produced by the digestive. They both break down proteins. They both work great at a temperature of 37 degrees, body temperature 37 degrees, but they work best at different pHs. Therefore, they're released at different points within your digestive tract as what you ingest, the nutrients you ingest pass through your digestive tract, okay? All right, this one here, I'm just gonna briefly mention. Enzymes. What was found for enzymes is that they're like you and I, okay? You're at work and you start doing your work and say your supervisor notices, hey, you're working pretty fast. Okay, I'm gonna give you more work. And so you're, you're able to adapt and you're able to keep a good pace going and then your supervisor sees, okay, well, dang, I increased the amount of workload I placed on you, so now I'm gonna increase it more. Eventually what happens? Or actually, eventually what happens is you reach your max. You reach a point where you can no longer work at a faster pace. Okay, the pace or the velocity at which you're working at, serious, it just reaches a plateau and you look at your supervisor and say, you can dump all the more work you want on here. I can't do any more than what I'm doing. It's similar to enzymes. Excuse the analogy, but I always try to do that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's the same for enzymes. So all I want you to know for substrate concentration is simply this. If you give an enzyme too little substrate, so on this x-axis here is substrate concentration. If you give an enzyme too little substrate, okay, the rate at which it's able to catalyze chemical reactions is going to be very low. Well below its maximum what? Rate. Okay. But if you give an enzyme the ideal amount of substrate concentration, now the enzyme, okay, can start producing the uh, concentration or the amount of product a cell needs to survive and function. Okay. But even if a cell wants the enzyme to do even more work and there's more substrate available, eventually that enzyme reaches what we call Vmax. In other words, I am working at the maximum velocity or pace that I can. I don't care how much more substrate you give me, I can no longer produce any more product. Now notice in this figure though, what they keep constant is there's only three enzymes in each section here. So they show you, so that's another thing. You take biochem, they'll do what they sometimes call dose response curves, things of that nature, uh, substrate concentrations. And basically what they're, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, look, I'm going to give you a certain quantity of proteins, but I'm going to vary the substrate concentration given to them. And then we're going to create a curve here to find out what is the maximum rate an enzyme can work at when the only variable is the amount of substrate being given to them. Everything else is held constant, including the concentration of enzymes. Notice it just stays at three. 
Okay, so that's all I want you to know. They don't have enough substrate. They can't produce enough product. They can't work at a maximum rate. You give them too much, they reach Vmax. I can't do anymore. So, and then it depends. The ideal substrate concentration for an enzyme, well, it depends on the enzyme. So this is why I'm not giving you anything extra or more. The last factor that affects enzyme function, these are molecules that are inhibitors. Okay, so please keep this in mind. This last factor, when I put inhibitors, okay, we are talking about molecules. There are two types of inhibitors. Some inhibitors are called competitive inhibitors. But some molecules are not only inhibitors, but they're called non-competitive inhibitors. Okay. The way it works is you first have to start over here. You have to keep in mind enzymes are proteins, so their shape is directly related to the function. Okay. When the enzyme has a correct shape, there's going to be that region of the enzyme that's going to function as the active site. The active site is a site that directly binds to reactants called substrates, and then they catalyze a chemical reaction. Well, scientists discovered there are certain molecules that not only are inhibitors, not only do they slow down, prevent, okay, or stop enzyme activity, okay, but they do it by competing with the substrate for the active side of the enzyme. Therefore, some molecules that are inhibitors are called competitive inhibitors. The reason for this is because the competitive inhibitor is directly competing with, and I'm going to put S for substrate, and I'll put it over here too. So for molecules called competitive inhibitors, okay, a competitive inhibitor, the reason why they put the, put the term competitive in front of it is because it's directly competing with the substrate for the active side on the enzyme. This is the catch. Molecules that are competitive inhibitors they don't have to have an overall shape that complements the entire active site, okay? They may have a shape that complements part of the active site, but enough of the active site, the enzyme binds to the inhibitor and hangs on to the inhibitor long enough that the enzyme doesn't bind to the substrate and therefore doesn't catalyze a chemical reaction. It's being physically prevented from binding to the substrate. Therefore, the enzyme is inhibited. No chemical reaction occurs. No product is produced. There are other molecules that function as non-competitive inhibitors. Okay. They use the prefix non because they are not competing directly for the active site. It's not happening. They're not doing that. Non-competitive inhibitors are molecules that bind to the enzyme in a region away from the active site. So you can see here, here's the region of the enzyme away from the active site. Here's the active site over here. But what happens is when a non-competitive inhibitor binds to a region on an enzyme other than the active site, it induces the enzyme to lose or causes the enzyme to lose its normal shape. When the enzyme loses its normal shape, notice the active site loses the shape that complements the shape of the substrate. Therefore, now the enzyme can't bind to the substrate because it's lost its normal shape, therefore it's lost its function. The way I describe, the way, the example or the analogy I use for a non-competitive inhibitor is if you've ever had somebody walk up and poke you in the side and it's caused your whole body to change shape to the point if you were carrying something, you may have dropped it. Okay, that's the only way I can think of it exp expressing it, okay? But that's the difference. They're both inhibitors. They both inhibit enzyme function. They both prevent the enzyme from binding to a substrate, therefore it can't produce product. But they do it in different ways by either directly binding to the active site, out competing the substrate, or by binding to a region away from the active site, but the overall protein enzyme loses its shape, therefore the active site loses its shape and can't grab onto the substrate. So again, remember, for non-competitive inhibitor, that's another example of a protein shape is directly related to its function. Okay, the last part, yes, we're at the last part. Regulation of enzyme activity helps control metabolism. 
These two words are synonyms of each other, everybody. Regulation is control. Control is regulation. All right. It's just a lot of people aren't familiar with the word regulation. <laughs> That's why our politicians love to use it. Okay. But um, in a cell, as I said before, okay, it, it's not about an enzyme having the optimal conditions, optimal tint, optimal pH, having the right concentration of substrate as well as any other reactants it needs to produce the product. Okay. It's also about the enzyme catalyzing a specific chemical reaction that result that occurs at a time when the cell needs it and results in a concentration of product okay that benefits the cell not too much product not too little the ideal amount of product therefore our cells have to regulate enzyme activity by regulating enzyme activity they are now regulating or controlling metabolism. In other words, they are now regulating or controlling chemical reactions. Okay? So if you look here, chemical chaos would result if a cell's metabolic pathways were not tightly regulated. A cell does this by switching on or off genes. We will visit this later in the semester in Chapter 17. Genes, I've said before, in chapter one, in this class, I'll tell you to think of them as protein recipes. Okay, in other words, genes encode or contain the code or the information that a cell needs so the cell knows how to synthesize or make a particular protein, but we're focused on what? Enzymes. So a cell is able to regulate enzyme activity by switching on and off genes that encode for specific enzymes, or a cell is able to regulate enzyme activity by compartmentalizing the enzyme or even using inhibitors. So I'm not going to focus on this one, genes, here. I'm going to focus on these latter ones. And I've broken it up, I believe, into basically three parts. Okay. One way cells regulate or control chemical reactions is through the regulation or control of enzymes using molecules called allosteric regulators. Okay. So here, this here, the guitar pick looking thing, and the, uh, I guess, the toenail looking thing here, okay? These are molecules that are functioning as allosteric regulators, okay? Allosteric regulators are molecules that will bind to an enzyme, okay? Regulating the enzyme's activity by either helping the enzyme become active or inhibiting the enzyme. So here it says, allosteric regulators, these are molecules that control enzymes, but they control enzymes with a quaternary structure. So here's our enzyme, and this is a quaternary structure. Each of these little purple things here represents the tertiary structure, a single polypeptide that's folded up completely, that have all complexed together. Down here is the same protein, or enzyme, I'm sorry, same enzyme, except notice its shape is a little different. Now here, it's getting more complex because when you're looking at a quaternary enzyme, an enzyme that exists at the quaternary protein structural level, okay, it's common for it to have more than one what? Active site, okay? But the way it ends up working is often these active sites are either available, in other words, they have the right shape so that they can bind to a substrate, or these multiple active sites don't have the correct shape to bind to the substrate. Therefore, the enzyme is in an inactive form. So enzymes oscillate. In other words, their shape isn't always set. Sometimes they kind of fluctuate. It's kind of like that uh, you, you may be this person or you may know somebody that can't sit still. Okay, you got to think of an enzyme a little bit like that. So the enzyme will oscillate. It'll, it'll change shapes to where it's active versus inactive. If it's active, the enzyme sites are available to bind the substrate. If it's inactive, it's because the active sites are have changed shape, okay, and they can't bind to the substrate. Now, the way it works is allosteric regulators are molecules, okay, that in the end help lock an enzyme either into its active form or inactive form. Okay, now there are other cellular processes that can occur to ensure that when that regulator, allosteric, that molecule called an allosteric regulator, there are other processes that occur 
to ensure that that regulator doesn't keep the enzyme in an active or inactive form. So it gets more complicated than this, okay? But for now, allosteric regulators are made up of molecules that are classified under two types. Some molecules are, called, are allosteric regulators. They lock an enzyme into an active form. Therefore, these molecules are more specifically called allosteric activators, which is one of two types of allosteric regulators. However, some molecules lock an enzyme into its inactive form. In this case, these molecules are not only allosteric regulators, but more specifically, they're called allosteric inhibitors. Now, notice for both of them, they actually don't interact with the active site. They bind to an area in between the protein subunits or tertiary structures that form this quaternary enzyme. Notice for both of them. But when they do it, if it's an allosteric activator, it's going to help lock the enzyme into its active form, preventing it from passively transitioning into an inactive form. It's going to lock it into its inactive form to where the active sites are available. Now it can do its job. But sometimes what it is for a cell is that it wants an enzyme to do work. So it wants it present, but it wants to make sure it controls when the enzyme does, uh, does perform its work. Okay, so what will happen is a cell will produce an enzyme and it's ready to go, but it will lock it into an inactive form using an allosteric inhibitor. But the cell wants that enzyme available to jump into action quickly when the time is right. Okay, you may have had that too. You may have had a job where they tell you, hey, I need you here, but you're not going to work right away. Yes. Yeah, sometimes it's uh, they're made. Sometimes it's something the cell took up from the extracellular environment. That answer your question? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So now, <clears throat> this is the second way. Okay. So the first way a cell can regulate, okay, metabolism by regulating enzymes is through allosteric regulators. That's one way. A second way a cell can regulate metabolism by regulating enzyme function is through what we call feedback mechanisms. Okay? Feedback mechanisms have to do with where some part of the chemical reaction ends up controlling the enzyme's activity. If you look here, just I'm going to start right over here. It's showing you we have an enzyme. Okay, now I'm not going to test you on specifics, everybody. They're actually giving you the name of this enzyme. It's threonine deaminase. There's the ASC, okay? I'm just going to say enzyme. But this enzyme here, it's one of a series or a chain of enzymes. Notice threonine deaminase is enzyme one, but they're showing you there's a series of enzymes, okay, that work together as a group to produce the final product needed by the cell. So the way it works is this has to do with amino acids, everybody. Okay, threonine and isoleucine are two of the 20 amino acids. Okay, so if you go back and look at your notes from chapter five, the 20 amino acids, you didn't have to know them, but these are two of the 20 amino acids, threonine and isoleucine. Some amino acids are essential. In other words, our cells can't make them, they have to obtain them through our diet. Other amino acids are non-essential. That means that our cells, if they have the available precursor, in other words, if they have a certain molecule available, they can transform it into one of the 20 amino acids. This is a case here, okay? It's been found that if cells have this, one of the 20 amino acids, three in it, that cells of our body, when needed, can transform this amino acid into a different amino acid called isoleucine whenever the cell can obtain it through its diet. But what happens, okay, is when a cell is low on this amino acid, isoleucine, but it has excess threonine, what will happen is this enzyme will come into play, and at its active site, it has a shape that complements this amino acid. It will bind to this amino acid and convert it to a product called intermediate A. Okay. A second enzyme then will come in and treat this product produced by enzyme 1, treat it as a substrate, and convert it into product intermediate B. 
And you can see here now enzyme three sees this not as a product, but as a substrate to convert it to product intermediate C. And then the fourth enzyme follows in the same pattern, but it uses this product from enzyme three as a substrate to produce another product intermediate D. And then finally, finally, the fifth enzyme in this series of enzymes takes this product intermediate D produced by enzyme four uses it as a substrate to produce the final or end product in this chemical pathway or series of chemical reactions, isoleucine. And as long as there's enough excess threonine available, and as long as the cell is lacking isoleucine, doesn't have enough of it, these five enzymes will continue to transform the excess threonine into isoleucine to bring the concentrations up for the cell so the cell can synthesize more proteins. The catch is, what happens in this case is that instead of the cell having to directly keep an eye on this chemical pathway or series of chemical reactions to know when it has enough isoleucine in there to st therefore stop this actively, the cell can do it passively through a feedback mechanism. Eventually, when the cell has enough of this product isoleucine produced to where now excess isoleucine that's not being used is being produced, what happens through a passive feedback mechanism is any extra isoleucine that's not needed by the cell, it also will act as a non-competitive inhibitor. The extra amino acids of isoleucine that the cell doesn't use, those extra ones will end up binding to a region of that first enzyme away from its active site, causing the enzyme to lose its shape and therefore its active site no longer can bind to threonine. This is a type of negative feedback mechanism where the product, once enough product is produced, any excess product that's not being used, okay, will end up binding to the enzyme that got this chemical pathway started, enzyme one, bind to it, causing it to change shape, thus inhibiting it. And what did I say before? When you have a group of enzymes working in a series or chain, okay, in this case, if enzyme 1 is inhibited, it will therefore not produce product intermediate A. That indirectly ends up inhibiting or cutting off the other enzymes. So it's a very efficient way. Sometimes you, the cell realizes, I don't have to directly go up to each enzyme and tell them to stop. If they're working in a series, okay, and each one works in a certain order, just shut off the first one, inhibit the first one, and you stop the end product being produced. So this is a second way to regulate enzyme function through feedback mechanisms. The third way to regulate enzyme function is through compartmentalization, and we're gonna visit this in chapter nine, cellular respiration. In chapter nine and chapter 10, we're gonna go over a total of three energy producing processes, two of them in detail, one briefly. The three of them are cellular respiration, fermentation, and photosynthesis. Chapter 9 will focus on cellular respiration and fermentation because both of them have to do with producing ATP. Okay, But for cellular respiration, when we go over cellular respiration, this is the chemical formula that you're given. But I said it's actually a summary, and I'll explain it more in next week's lecture. But the way it works for cellular respiration is it consists of three stages. The first stage happens out here in the cytosol of the cell. However, the second and third stage, especially the third stage, which produces most of the ATP, it all happens here within the membranous organelle known as a mitochondria for plural, mitochondrion is singular, okay? What scientists discovered is within the mitochondria, embedded in its inner membrane are many, many enzymes, okay, that are associated with cellular respiration. In other words, in the end producing ATP but they're compartmentalized. They cannot leave the mitochondria. They are part of the inner mitochondrial membrane. So in order for these enzymes to participate in this process cellular respiration, the cell has to transport organic molecules in O2 over to them within this organelle. But it works out great, okay? These enzymes are compartmentalized. They're contained within the mitochondria, Therefore, the only way they can do work is when the cell gives them what they need. The cell has to transport it to them. But also, this prevents other chemical reactions or other chemical reactions being catalyzed by other enzymes from interfering with them too. 
So in a manner of speaking, compartmentalization, you can also think of as isolation of enzymes within membranous organelles so that they only do work when the cell gives them what they need, but at the same time, it keeps other process, cellular processes from interfering with them also, okay? So we'll visit this. So I use this last because this last slide is what's going to help us transition into the beginning of Chapter 9. I'm sorry it didn't go smoothly, especially when I misspoke about the glucose transporter one more time. It's involved in passive process called facilitated diffusion. I misspoke about that, okay? So uh, make sure uh, you keep that in mind. Uh, it's a lot of biochem, okay? A lot of what I test you off is heavily pulled off your notes and what I went over for this PowerPoint. Textbook will probably give you a lot of extra. Use the notes I gave you as your guide so that you know when you need to focus on something in the text or when they're giving you too much and you can move on, okay? Are there any questions? Y'all awake? Okay, listen carefully. I decided to go ahead and um, do the lab overview uh, live. Uh, it's a membrane transport lab focusing on diffusion osmosis. And when I was looking at the lab, I thought, you know what? I was going to record it yesterday, and then I thought, no, no, we need to go over this in person. So listen carefully. We'll come. I'll come back online at 11:40 and collaborate. I'll go over uh, the lab five overview try to point out some things that will hopefully help you out with the lab report, okay? I didn't provide a Word doc version of Lab 4 because one of the links didn't work, but if you want, I can, I can go ahead and post it. It's the link given in the pre-lab. It's the same link that's given to you at the beginning of the lab procedure. So if you want, I can go ahead and post it. If that will help you out, just keep that in mind. Would you like me to do that still, Casey? I can't really, uh, you're breaking up. I can't understand. Oh, well, what I said is I didn't post the word doc because one of the links wasn't working, but it's the same link that's given at the beginning of the lab procedure. So I can post the word doc if you want. I'm going to post Did I lose you, Casey? <laughs> 